After four horrible, torturous, painstakingly long weeks, Jujutsu Kaisen is finally returning. I originally thought this break was going to be a great opportunity for me to pump out content, but goddamn was I wrong. The break was so long that even the strongest JJK enjoyers took some time off. And that of course means my channel's performance took a dive all the way into hell itself, where it got brutally touched by Satan's minions, aka the YouTube comments. It actually reached a point where Kagurabachi videos were outperforming JJK videos. Videos. Do you know how depressing that is for a JJK channel? Fortunately though, this dark time in our lives is coming to an end because we are mere days away from seeing what absolute masterclass Gege has cooked up during his well-deserved rest. Plot twists will be revealed, crackpot theories will be shared, and unhealthy amounts of copium will undoubtedly return because Jujutsu Kaisen is back. So I decided before chapter 263 finally drops, it would be a good idea to summarize and discuss every single unsolved mystery and unanswered question in JJK. And there is a lot of of them, and I mean like a lot. The conclusion of the video is then going to be a little section where I ruthlessly lecture you all about how JJK literally cannot end this year. It is impossible, I simply will not allow it. But the harsh reality of it is that it could be straight copium. It genuinely could just end this year in the next 20 chapters. I don't think that's enough to have a good ending. I think it will fing suck, and I just, I need more. But like, look, okay, right, this is for the end of the video, right? Let's just get into the other unsolved mystery bullshit. The first half of this slightly shit posty video is basically about JJK's unexplained history and character backstories. And of course, we're going to be starting things off with none other than Ryoman Fraudkiner and his personal maid slash chef slash finger collector slash foot warmer. There's no denying that Sukuna is the strongest sorcerer based off his recent feats, but when it comes to his title as the strongest in history, then it's literally just all statements. We know so little about Sukuna's upbringing, his greatest battles, how he met Arame, how he met Kenjaku, what his CT truly does, and of course, why he looks like a junky version of forearms. So many crucial and interesting questions with very few answers despite being 260 chapters deep. Plus, any information we do get is just the occasional panel of Sukuna explaining it. It's always tell and no show. What we need is 10 plus chapters of Heian Era flashbacks dedicated to giving us this information on Sukuna. I'll be completely real with you guys though, I really don't care for Sukuna's character backstory as much as some of you guys do. Some people want the Demon Slayer bullshit of looking at Sukuna's tragic life and just justifying why he is how he is. Sukuna himself says that's not the case though, he is just selfish, bored, and stronger than everyone else. There doesn't need to be any deeper meaning or depressing backstory, he is just Sukuna, and I really like that. That being said though, if you're gonna go down the route of just having him being a monster, then you need to actually show it happening. We still need to see him actually f shit up in the Heian era instead of just dropping random statements. Now don't get me wrong, the four heavy hitters of Yuta, Yuji, Maki, and Ino are all definitely worthy opponents, but all the rest are just fodder. In the Heian era, he was getting jumped by an army of special grades and still winning. I want to see that. I don't want to see Miwa versus Sukuna. I also do just like seeing Sukuna do crazy shit because it slightly upscales Gojo, Yuta, Yuji, and Maki. And I'm sure it would apply to Hakari too, but he actually needs to fight Sukuna first in order for that to happen. Anyway, then there is the mystery of the strongest chef in history. How did Sukuna stumble across a Rame, and why is their technique eerily similar to Sukuna's? See, these are all things that I want to see and not be told, although with the way the manga's going, I'm a little bit worried we're just never gonna see it. Now, perhaps the greatest mystery box in the entire series is none other than the one who took it from behind. The White Splash Merchant, the strongest Japper in history, Ken Backshots Jaku. Now, I may not care for Sukuna's deep and meaningful backstory, but the same cannot be said for my goat Kenjaku. He is such a pivotal character and is by far the most threatening villain in the entire series. And I'm sorry Sukuna freaks, but the fact is your boy's threat level pales in comparison to Big Jaku's. Our lord and saviour Kusakabe GPT outright states this factual fact in chapter 248. Kanjaku is just the bigger threat. Kanjaku has been at the centre of everything, pulling the strings for over a thousand years. Considering his seemingly close personal history with Tengen, it's very possible that he actually is from before the Heian era. Hell, he may even be from before the Nara era, given that he was able to forge a vow with Druv, who was actually from way before then. In fact, there's a theory that Kanjaku is actually the founder of sorcery altogether, which I think is pretty cool. Now, Kanjaku is a textbook liar and manipulator who has the most knowledge on Jujutsu out of anyone in the entire series. That doesn't mean he's necessarily the best at using it, because that would be Sukuna, but he definitely has the most knowledge. We actually know scarily little about his previous hosts and the actions that he took across history, and we still don't even know his true motives, let alone his supposed relationship to Tengen. Yuji's creation has been somewhat explained, but Kanjaku's true intentions for Yuji and how he plays into the merger plan are still a little bit unclear. He may be gone for now, but I think Kanjaku is far from done cooking just yet. I mean, don't forget, this man literally made the f 
fucking king of curses his bitch and personal guard dog. And then there's this whole thing about how he manages to transfer his curse techniques over and how his technique actually works. We really don't know a lot about that and it's very important. These are all things that have so much potential that we can see in a flashback backstory if Gege ever decides to actually do it. I really need it. There's so much potential there. Okay, literally every single thing that I just said about Kenjaku also applies to Tengen. It's been alluded to by Kenjaku himself that Tengen is actually hella shady and she may also have her own agenda in all of this completely. Wait, in, in all of this... Com Look, it's been a while since I made a video, guys. Okay, I, I'm not good at speaking, all right? I've just had a... Like, just leave me alone. You know what I mean? Now, from the way they interact, it's very clear that Kenjaku and Tengen had some kind of relationship back in the day, although we don't know what that would be. Many think that they were doing it body style, but I don't think that's really the case. Given the petty way that they interact and the fact that they both have very similar life-prolonging techniques, I'm of the opinion that they are actually siblings, maybe even twins. The star religious group, Ghetto, Toji, the merger, Yuji Itadori, all of these pivotal parts of JJK can all be traced back to Kenjaku and Tengen. There's also the fact that Tengen looks a lot like Heian Sukuna, something Kenjaku himself actually notices and points out. Now, if the theory of Kenjaku and Tengen being Sukuna's parents is true, then Kenjaku's gonna be heading out for milk real soon because he does not seem to be aware of it. It also royally f***s up the family tree because then Kenny would be Sukuna's dad and Sukuna's nephew's mother. Oh, it's all f***ed okay? It's exactly why we need some answers. Look, the point is, both Kenjaku and Tengen are wildly important mystery boxes, which also need explaining with show and not tell. Okay, we're gonna move back to the present now and very briefly discuss one of the biggest unsolved problems right now. And that problem is everybody's favorite, Mummy Maharaga summoning, dog loving, rabbit abusing, Megami fuck my life, Fushiguro. Now, I don't want to waste all my material in one video, so I'm not gonna drop any theories on it, but Megami still needs saving. It's as simple as that. He's gotta be pulled out of his depression, Find a way to escape Sukuna or fight in his innate domain. He's also got to have his crazy power up and awakening from being in Sukuna and having his curse techniques full potential unlocked. Not to mention the fact Megami technically has control of the merger. Now even if Sukuna wanted to activate it before Megami is freed, he would still need to kill every single Culling Games player, including our main character, in order to do it. There are a ridiculous amount of possibilities and ways for Gege to write the merger into the story, and for that exact reason, it becomes really hard to predict. It's something that we just have to sit back and let happen. I think we're definitely close now, but it's been a very long time since Megami or the merger were even mentioned. It's easily one of the biggest unsolved mysteries that I don't think anyone has accurately predicted, no matter how right they think they are. We just have to sit and wait. Until recently, this applied to Toto as well, but another big mystery is the matter of Nobara Kugisaki's current status. The same applies to Takaba, Kusakabe, and Yuta's original body, but Nobara has been MIA for the longest, so I feel she is deserving of a mention. With the way we're currently headed and Toto's return, though, it's looking like this particular mystery might actually be solved very soon. Call it copium all you want, but I'm just gonna move on by saying this. I think she returns in the next 5 to 10 chapters, if we even get 5 to 10 chapters. Another highly popular unanswered question in JJK is the current status of Hakari and Arame. I mean, they have been fighting for so long that some people think an entire enemies to lovers story has occurred and that they are now passionately engaging in coitus. As funny as that is though, it genuinely may not be that far from the truth. They could just not not be fighting anymore. I mean, if stalling a Rame is the goal, then trying to keep up a conversation is not a bad strategy. And over the course of about five chapters, their positions have not changed one bit. It genuinely does seem like they're just talking right now. Now, one thing I really want to see, though, is a Rame's reaction to Sukuna's failed domain and Yuta's return as Gojo right as they pulled the nah I'd win pose. All in all, though, Hakari is the one who's looking worse for wear in those brief cutaways. We definitely need a Hakari vs. Rame chapter very soon, and honestly, I think it just needs to be wrapped up at this point. One one of the things that I'm easily the most curious about is all of this secret soul stuff going on. First off, I want to know exactly who everyone swapped with, but more importantly, I want to know why. Kusakabe and Yuji swap was obvious, simple domain. Yuta and Gojo swap was also obvious, cursed energy control and having that amazing barrier. Yuta and Yuji swap, however, is still a complete mystery. I mean, sure, there are definitely some valid theories about outputting reverse curse technique, but it's still not confirmed. And on the topic of souls, we also have no idea what's inside Yuki's soul book. It seems that the main cast actually have a lot more knowledge than we're actually aware of, and I'm hoping we get to see it in detail very soon. Gege also has this thing where he just cannot strike a good balance between show and tell. We have lots of Heian era statements and are told so many cool events, but we never actually get to see them. We need flashbacks showing these things like Yorozu versus the five empty generals, Uro's backstory, and the battles against Sukuna. The three vengeful spirits and the beef between clans is also something that should be shown for better world building. On the other hand though, Gege sometimes fully shows and doesn't tell, which causes 
causes unnecessary confusion. For example, we still don't know if Sukuna used the world cutting slash on Yuta or Maki. Everything stated in this video are things that I believe we need to see in decent detail before JJK ends in order for it to have a truly peak fiction status. Unfortunately, it's entirely possible that JJK ends this year and we never explore some of these things, which would be so disappointing and a massive waste of potential. I have hope that we will go into 2025 at least and see most of these things, but it's definitely possible that we don't. JJK finishing this year would mean a maximum of like 25 more chapters, but realistically it would be more like 18 to 20 chapters. But even the full 25 would be nowhere near enough to have a good ending in my opinion. I think it genuinely needs to break 300 chapters as the bare minimum, which means that we need to continue into 2025. Although I'll be honest, if we really want to do it properly, it needs to go into 2026. Overall though, Jujutsu Kaisen has so much potential and so many unsolved mysteries, which I am scared we are never gonna see. But the good news is, Jujutsu Kaisen is back from its break, meaning I can start pumping out theories and hopefully save my channel from the depths of hell. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, feel free to join my Discord server and follow me on Twitter, links below. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you soon to discuss the long-awaited chapter 263.